testing one and two. Praise the Lord. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. We are so blessed to have you. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to our online family. Thank you for, for joining us and watching online. We are so blessed that you joined us today. And today we're going to continue on our types and shadows of the Lord Jesus in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, there are pictures after pictures of the Lord Jesus in the book of Genesis. All through the Old Testament, there are many different types, shadows, pictures of Jesus in the Word of God. It's just awesome when you study and compare the scriptures with the types and pictures of the Lord Jesus. And we talked briefly about the Passover lamb in Exodus 12 being a picture of the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God. We talked about it briefly when we touched on the feast of Passover. And next week we'll, and when we get to the book of Exodus especially, we will zero in and talk more in detail about how the Passover lamb is a picture of Jesus, our lamb. And I want us to cover two types, two shadows, two pictures of the Lord Jesus today. And I, we're going to talk about the Akedah, is the Hebrew term, the binding of Isaac, where Abraham took his son Isaac up and laid him on that altar, bound him, Akedah, or tied him to that altar. And don't think I've heard that story a thousand times in sermons, and I've read it a hundred times in my Bible. And, and don't think that you can't learn something, because I learned something as I was studying in order to prepare to teach you about Isaac, being a type, a shadow, a picture of the Lord Jesus and that ram caught in the thicket. Now, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, the Word of God says, And it came to pass, after these things, that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, he named me, here I am. And now, a lot of people get hung up on that one word in this verse, tempt. This word tempt, everybody asks, does God really tempt us? And when you have a question like this, always go to the scriptures and let the scripture interpret scripture. Now, the word of God says in James chapter 1, verse 13, let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. So does God tempt us? No, this verse tells us plainly, clearly, that we cannot say when we're tempted that it's God tempting us. God would never tempt his people. And what does this word tempt mean in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, that God did tempt Abraham? Well, you go to the Hebrew or Greek, if it's a New Testament word, if you have a question in the Bible about what a word means, and here is the Old Testament, so you would go to your Hebrew concordance, either the Young's concordance, the Strong's Concordance, the Briggs Driver uh, Hebrew Concordance and Lexicon. If you have a question about what a word means, look it up in the original language. So when you look this word tempt up in a Hebrew Concordance, in the Brown Driver and Briggs Hebrew Lexicon, it says this word tempt, it's number 5254. It means to test, to try, to prove or to put to the proof or test. So God proved. He tried. He tested Abraham. God gave Abraham a test. And what was the test that God gave to Abraham? 
verse 2 tells us. Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. And he, God, said to Abraham, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Mount Moriah is the highest mountain in the region of Jerusalem. And Jewish Bible scholars say that Mount Moriah is where God told Abraham to go. Now, verses 3 through 4 of Genesis 22. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass or his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clay. Now that's a King James word that we don't use today. This word clay means to split. He split the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. He looked up as he was climbing that mountain, he looked up and he saw the place where God had told him to go and offer his son Isaac at the place. Now, notice verse 4. Notice the phrase on the third day. The third day, Abraham lived in Beersheba, which is about 42 miles from Jerusalem. So that's why it took them three days to get from Beersheba to Jerusalem. They were traveling Donkey Express. They couldn't hop in their car, drive 70 miles an hour down the interstate, and get there in an hour. No, they were riding those donkeys. It took them three days to get to the place. Verse 5, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass. Stay right here with this donkey. And I and the lad will go yonder. Where? To the place that God had showed him. I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now notice what Abraham said to his servants. You stay right here and we, Isaac and I, will go and worship and then we will come back down here to where you are what faith abraham had god had already told him you sacrifice your son upon the altar you kill your son isaac but here abraham is saying to his servants we the lad and i isaac and i we are going up on the mountain and worship but then we will come back down. Now, how could Abraham say that? How did he know that Isaac was coming back down that mountain with him? How did he know that? Because God had told him to burn his son Isaac on the altar as, that, as a burnt sacrifice. So how did Abraham know that Isaac was coming back down that mountain? Hebrews chapter 11 the great hall of fame chapter in our bible hebrews chapter 11 verses 17 through 19 gives us the answer uh, by faith abraham when he was tried offered up isaac and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now notice it says Abraham was tried, not tempted, like it said in Genesis 22. So the King James translators translated this word correctly this time. God didn't tempt Abraham. God tried him. He tested him. Abraham had the promise of God 
that God had already spoken to him even before Isaac was born. God had told Abraham that in thy seed, your descendants, your son, shall all of the nation of Israel be called. In your son Isaac shall thy seed or descendants be called of me. And God had promised to give Abraham a whole nation of descendants. How? Through his son Isaac. And God had worked a miracle. You know when Isaac was born because Abraham and Sarah, both of them, were too old to have children in the natural. Abraham was 100 years old, and Sarah was 90 years old. Genesis 21, 5 and Genesis 18, 11. If you want to jot those scriptures down and look them up, Genesis 21, 5 and Genesis 18, 11. Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90. So in Abraham's mind, it was just as easy for God to raise Isaac from the dead as it was to, for God to give Isaac life from Sarah's dead womb. So Abraham already had the promise of God that in your seed, in your descendants, I'm going to raise up an entire nation. So Abraham knew, he had already saw it in his mind's eye, that if he burned his son Isaac upon that altar as a burnt sacrifice, he knew that God had to, through his son Isaac, give him seed, descendants, and raise up a nation through Isaac. So Abraham could see in his mind's eye that even if he burned Isaac and all that was left on that altar was his ashes, Abraham, through his mind's eye, received him Isaac back from a figure. He pictured the scene. Now, if I burn my son upon the altar, God will blow on those ashes and raise him back to life. Abraham was so sure of the promise that God had already gave to him that through your son Isaac, I'm going to raise up seed unto myself. I'm going to raise up an entire nation. So Abraham, in his mind's eye, knew that he and Isaac was coming back down that mountain. One way or another, they were both coming back because Isaac wasn't married yet. He didn't have children yet to carry on his family name. Now, Genesis chapter 22, verses 6 through 9. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, He need thee. Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound. There's our word. Hebrew is akidah. Abraham bound, tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Now, most preachers portray Isaac as just this little boy about the age of, of Nikki's little son. Most preachers preach that Isaac was just a little bitty boy and was too small and too weak to resist his father. But that could not have been the case because Isaac was big enough, strong enough, old enough to carry wood to burn an entire sacrifice with. Think about how much wood it would take to burn a lamb upon an altar as a burned sacrifice. So Isaac was big enough, strong enough to carry that wood, not just a few feet, but up 
the mountainside to the top of a mountain. And Bible scholars estimate Isaac to be from 17 to 25 years old. And some Jewish rabbis believe that Isaac was 33 years old. And if anyone would know, then Jewish rabbis would know because the Jewish people kept such accurate records. If you don't believe that, just turn to the begat sometime and read who begat who, whose son was whose son, how old they were when they had their children, and you will see that they kept such accurate records. So Isaac was plenty old enough, plenty strong enough to refuse to let his father Abraham, who was 133 years old at the time or older, Isaac could have said, no, you're not tying me up. No, you're not going to put me on that offer of wood. I will not do it, daddy. Isaac didn't do that. He was a willing sacrifice. Isaac willingly walked up the mountain carrying that wood to become a sacrifice. And over 1,800 years later, another man walked up this same mountain carrying wood in order to become a sacrifice. For you see, Mount Moriah and Mount Calvary is the same place. Ah! Oh, Look at verses 3 and 4 of Genesis 22 again. Abraham took Isaac and went where? Unto the place. Now Luke chapter 23 verse 33 says, speaking of Jesus, and when they were come to what? The place, which is called Calvary. There they crucified him and the male factors, the one on the right hand, the other on the left. So Abraham took Isaac up on Mount Moriah, Isaac carrying the wood to become the sacrifice. And then approximately 1,800 years later, Jesus walked up that same mountain. He came to the place called Calvary. There he was crucified on that wooden cross that he carried. Oh, think about it. Now, we're going to cover it in detail next week. This is just the introduction of Isaac and the ram caught in the thicket, being a type, a shadow, a picture of the Lord Jesus. Abraham is a type, a shadow, a picture of God the Father. And Isaac is a type, a shadow, a picture of Jesus the Son. So the Father is willing to sacrifice his Son, and the Son is willing to give up his life. Isaac was Abraham's only begotten Son, the Son of Promise. Ishmael was not. Isaac was called Abraham's only begotten son. And Jesus is God's only son. Isaac's birth was miraculous because, as I told you a few minutes ago, Sarah was past childbearing years. And I gave you the scripture, Genesis 18, 11. And Jesus' birth was miraculous because he was born of a virgin named Mary. Isaac and Abraham's journey up that mountain took how long? Three days. And Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection took how long? Three days. And just as Isaac was offered up on the third day, Jesus was perfected on the third day. He arose from that tomb that he had been buried in for three days. In Luke chapter 13, verse 31, the Pharisees, they came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, you better leave because King Herod is going to kill you. And verse 32, and he, Jesus, said unto them, go ye and tell that fox. You go and tell that fox, King Herod. Behold, look, 
I cast out devils and I do cures or I do miracles and I heal people today and tomorrow and the third day. What day? The third day I shall be perfected. Oh, Isaac and Abraham's journey took three days to get up to the top of that mountain. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection took how long? Third day, three days. On the third day, he was perfected. Oh, hallelujah. Just as Isaac carried that wood upon which he was to be sacrificed, Jesus carried the wooden cross upon which he was crucified in John chapter 19, verses 16 through 17. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing or carrying his cross, went forth. And then later when Jesus could no longer carry that cross, the Roman soldiers made a man named Simon carry Jesus' cross the rest of the way. Now, just as Isaac was bound or tied, Jesus was also bound or tied. Matthew chapter 27, verse 2. And when they had bound or tied Jesus, they led him away. Now, if Isaac was 33 years old, as some Jewish rabbi scholars believe, then he was the exact same age of Jesus when Jesus was crucified because Jesus was 33 years old when he died on the cross. Now, approximately 900 years after Abraham offered up Isaac upon the altar on Mount Moriah, the temple was built in the place of sacrifice. It was a place of sacrifice for millions of lambs all throughout the years to be offered up upon the altar. So approximately 900 years after Abraham climbed that mountain with Isaac, offered Isaac on that altar, approximately 900 years later, the temple was built where millions of lambs were sacrificed throughout the years. And it was the temple was built on the same mountain, Mount Moriah. How do we know that? The word tells us. 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Where? In Mount Moriah. Where did Abraham and Isaac go? On Mount Moriah. And then approximately 900 years after the temple was built, in the same place on Mount Moriah, Jesus, the perfect, sinless Lamb of God, was also sacrificed on this mountain because Mount Moriah and Mount Calvary is the same place. Now, let's finish the story here in Genesis chapter 22, verses 10 through 14. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay or to kill his son, to plunge it into Isaac's heart. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, He nanny. God called through that angel. God called unto Abraham and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, and seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. That was Abraham's test. God didn't tempt him. God tested him. Verse 13, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. So Abraham looked up and he saw that ram hung, caught in that thicket by his horns. Verse 14. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Yireh is the Hebrew word Jehovah Jireh. For it is said to this day in the mouth of the Lord it shall be seen. Now 
Jehovah Nireh, the Hebrew word, and in English it's Jehovah Jireh in verse 14. This Hebrew word, Jehovah Jireh, in our English Bibles means the Lord will see. It's also translated in some versions as the Lord will provide. So Jehovah Yireh, Jehovah Jireh, is one of the many Hebrew names for God, which literally means God who sees ahead and provides. God knew that Abraham would need a substitute for his son Isaac. So God saw ahead and provided a ram. A ram. At the same time, God was sending Abraham and Isaac up one side of the mountain on Mount Moriah. God was sending that ram up the other side of the mountain. Look at the last part of verse 14 again. And it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Some of the more accurate translations say, on this mount, the Lord shall be seen. And approximately 1,800 years after Abraham offered Isaac on this mountain. The Lord Jesus was seen on this mountain as he hung upon the cross and died. For what? Mount Moriah and Mount Calvary is the same place. Jesus became our substitute. Just as that ram became Isaac's substitute. And what is a ram? A ram is a male sheep, a male lamb. So this ram is a type, a shadow, a picture of Jesus, our lamb. Isaac was supposed to be sacrificed on that altar, but the ram became the substitute. You and I should have died, but instead Jesus became our substitute. Where was this ram caught? In a thicket, which literally means a thicket of thorns. This ram was caught by its horns in a thicket of thorns. Have you ever been blackberry picking? Oh, my mom. We didn't have money to buy food when I was growing up. Mom raised their food in the garden and she would take us in the, in the spring and she'd make us go blackberry picking. And old mom would just go at it with both hands. Her, bu her bucket would be just rounded up with those blackberries. And us kids would have, might have enough blackberries to cover the bottom of our bucket. Why? Because we didn't like those thorns. And we would try to reach gingerly around and not get stuck by those blackberry thorns as we picked those blackberries. And it, we would complain and say, oh, mama, we're tired. Can we go to the house? No, we don't have enough yet for blackberry jelly. You're going to enjoy this blackberry je jelly come fall and winter. So get to picking. Get to work, kids. So I would think. Oh, I know what mom's talking about. Cause in the fall, in the winter, mom would cook those big cat head biscuits on her wooden stove. That, and those biscuits were so big they'd cover about half of our plate. And we'd slice those biscuits and then mom, she'd put homemade butter that she had churned. She'd milk the cow, then churn that milk into butter. And I can picture mom right now in a rocking chair, rocking back and forth as she churned that milk into butter. And she'd be praying all the time. And she'd, she'd churn and pray in rhythm, never breaking her rhythm as she sat there churning that milk and making butter. And I'd think about her putting that butter on those big old cat head biscuits and then putting that blackberry jelly on it, and us kids would just dive in, and we'd have butter and jelly running down our elbows. Oh, it was so good. So that motivated us kids to keep picking those blackberries, and it never failed. Oh, we'd try so carefully to not get stuck by those thorns, but I'd reach out, and 
when uh, one of those black married briars would grab my sleeve and I'd pull and pull and couldn't get loose. So then I'd reach with the other sleeve and arm to try to get this one unhung. And then this one would get hung. And there, there I am, both hands, and I'm pulling and pulling and pulling. And couldn't get loose. And so I'd lean over and then my hair would get hung in the thorns. And I'm going, oh, oh. And then, then my pants leg would get hung. And I would just, the more I struggled, the more thorns would grab my clothes. And I'd cry, Mom, I can hear she'd come and get me untangled. Well, this is the same thing that happened to this ram. This ram was, was eating away, eating away, eating away. He leaned over, and his horns got caught in those thorns. In that, in that thicket of thorns. And we picture a horn being a cow horn or a deer horn. No, these horns were used to make shofar, ram's horns. And they are two to three foot long and they're curved and twisted. So when that ram was had leaned over, its horns had got caught in those briars, in those thorns. And the more that ram shook its head and tried to free itself, the more entangled that the horns became. So this ram was literally crowned with those thorns around its head. Think about it. the Passover lamb that we talked about when we mentioned the feast of Passover back in Exodus. Exodus 12, that Passover lamb. Do you remember how they prepared that lamb for roasting? The Jewish father would hang that, that Passover lamb on hooks, spread its forearms apart in a crucifixion pose, slid it down, down its belly, open it up, and they would take the internal organs out, wash them, clean them, and the Jewish mother would take a portion of that ram's intestines, wrap those intestines around that lamb's head, and then they would roast that lamb. So that Passover lamb was literally crowned with those intestines. Well, this ram caught in the thicket of thorns was literally crowned with those thorns. And just as that ram was crowned with thorns, Jesus, our lamb, wore what? A crown of thorns. Now, Abraham took that ram, crowned with those thorns, and that ram became a sacrifice in the place or in the stead of Isaac, his son, who should have died. Well, Jesus, another sacrifice, crowned with thorns, took the place of one who should have died, you and I. Jesus wore a crown because he bore the curse of sin of mankind. He died in our place just as that ram died in the place of Isaac. That ram was sacrificed instead of Isaac. Jesus was sacrificed instead of you and I. Look at verses 7 and 8 again of Genesis 22. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, He nay me, here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, look, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, now look at this. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Abraham is speaking prophetically here in this verse. He says God will provide himself a lamb. God will provide himself as the lamb. 1,800 years later after Abraham offered his son Isaac, 1,800 years later, God the Father offered his son Jesus. Jesus was that willing sacrifice. Jesus provided himself as the lamb to be offered up and slain for our sins. Verse 8, God will provide himself a lamb. And 
and Jesus, the Lamb of God, did indeed provide himself as that sacrificial lamb. I was reading this passage years ago, and when I came to this verse, I saw it for the first time. God will provide himself a lamb. And God spoke this truth to my heart. God's presence was so real that day. It was so holy. I, I never told anyone about this for years. And there are other truths that the Holy Spirit has just brought to light, just revealed the, the truth from the Holy Written Word. There are other truths that I just haven't talked about. I can't talk about them yet. They're just too holy to speak of. They're just too reverent to speak of. And this was one of those verses that I didn't even speak about for years because every time I would read it, I would see how God provided himself as that lamb. Jesus provided himself. He said, Father, I will go. If there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will, Father. I will go. I will provide myself as the lamb to be sacrificed for all of mankind. Jesus looked 2,000 years down in the, in the future, and he saw your face, and he saw my face. And he said, Father, I will provide myself as that sacrificial lamb to be sacrificed and offered up and wear that crown of thorns and carry, bear the sin of mankind so that they may be redeemed and bought back and become our children and live forever with us in heaven. Yes, Father, I will provide myself as the Lamb. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Can you say Amen to the Lamb of God? Amen, Amen, Amen. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Don't know about you, but I can't hardly stand it when I 